All right, this is Sean McCloskey again. Welcome to part three of the Competition Killer. On today's session, I'm gonna to talk to you about how to virtually eliminate your competition. Once you deal with the homeowner, you don't want them ever dealing with anyone else again. And the way you do this is you need to set the right expectations with the homeowner right up front. And I usually now make it a point for, when I deal with a homeowner, I make it a point to let them know not to deal with any other investors once I start the short sale, it's not in their best interest to deal with any other investors. And here's why. I've got a little story that I'll share with you. And you're more than welcome to use this story in your own transactions. You can just say my business partner had this experience and let me share with you what happened. Uh, but I had a house that I dealt with um, that a woman named Mrs. Watson called me up a little while back. And Mrs. Watson had a house that was in South City here in St. Louis, Missouri, where I live. And South City is kind of an older area. There's lots of brick houses, you know, houses anywhere from 50 to 125 years old down in South City. And so, you know, many houses that are that old come with uh, some challenges, whether that means they need updating or repairs and so on. So I talked to Mrs. Watson, and Mrs. Watson, come to find out, owes about $75,000 on this house. Now, I know the area, and it might sell for seventy-five or 80000 This isn't a high-income area. Matter of fact, where I live in St. Louis, the average price house is about 150000 So take this and relate it to whatever area you live in. Maybe your average pricing is a little higher or a little lower. It doesn't matter. Uh, the percentages still work the same. But she owed about seventy-five grand on the house. And of course, as an investor, I want to go in and steal that baby and get it as cheap as I possibly can, right? So I go out and I meet Mrs. Watson at the house and I do everything that you're supposed to do. I did everything right. I built rapport with her very well off the, off the bat, right off the phone, first phone call. I went out to the appointment, got everything that I needed to get to start the short sale with the bank. Started the short sale with the bank and the bank did what's called ordering a BPO. BPO stands for Broker's Price Opinion. It's nothing more than a glorified appraisal. So the bank ordered their appraisal and the appraiser met me out at the house and when he did, one of the first things he noticed is one of the first things I noticed. And that is the house was leaning a little bit to the left. <laughs> it had some foundation issues. Now, there's a lot of people out there that get scared to death by foundation issues, myself being one of them. But I happen to know from our local uh, real estate investor club that there's a guy there that doesn't mind foundation issues at all. So I was keeping him in mind as somebody that I could call when and if I got an approval to buy this house. But it was great because the first time the uh, guy doing the BPO or the appraisal pulled up, that's the first thing he noticed. And my question to him was, do you think that will affect the value of the house? And he goes, are you kidding me? Who wants a crooked house with foundation issues? Of course it's going to affect the value. So he puts in a, a very low value on the house. And lo and behold, I'm able to buy this property for $14,750. That's what I get my approval for from the bank, at least verbally. Now, that's a pretty big discount. That's a $60,000 discount right off the bat that I got on this house. Pretty significant discount. Can I make some money at this pricing? You better believe it. Am I excited at this pricing? You better believe it. So I start making some phone calls. I call up this guy that I met at our local RIA club and I talk to him about it and he puts together an offer to buy it from me for $26,000, which means that even after my expenses closing, I'm gonna end up netting somewhere around $11,000 on this deal. I've only got about four hours worth of time into this deal invested so far. It's a very quick, simple deal in and out. So I'm excited about it. We're setting up our closing paperwork and everything, I'm ready to go. Now meanwhile, I haven't gotten an official written approval from my bank yet that I was dealing with, Mrs. Watson's lender. Uh, however, I got a verbal from her over the phone saying that they would approve my $14,750, which is why I went out and started marketing it to my real estate investor friend. Well, lo and behold, the very next day I get a call from Mrs. Watson's lender. And Mrs. Watson's lender says, I'm sorry, I can't approve your $14,750 offer now. Who is this that put in an offer for $25,000 on the same property? And I'm going, what? what? What are you talking about? What's going on here? She says, somebody submitted an offer to me via fax this morning for $25,000 on the same exact property. And I'm thinking, what is going on here? What do you mean somebody? I'm the only one that has authorization to speak on behalf of Mrs. Watson. I don't understand. And she goes, no, I have the offer right here. It's from a guy named Butch Jenkins. Does Butch work with you? I didn't know what to say. I, so I said, I don't know, maybe he works out of my office and maybe I just haven't met him yet. I don't, let me find out what's going on and I'll call you back. 
So naturally, I hang up the phone, I call Mrs. Watson back, and I say, Mrs. Watson, and by the way, I'm devastated at this point, because I'm thinking, she had to have gone behind my back and dealt with another investor. And I thought, all right, well, I'm not gonna jump to conclusions yet, but I called Mrs. Jenkins, and my thought process was, man, we built such good rapport, I got along with her so well, why is she doing this? So I called up Miss Jenkins and I said, Mrs. Jenkins, what's going on here? Somebody, who is Butch Jenkins? And she said, oh, he's another investor that does exactly what you do. And I thought, oh, what do you mean he does what I do? Did you talk to him? What's going on? And she said, yeah, he came over a few days ago and he talked me into signing another contract with him as kind of a backup contract and said that if I dealt with him, then you know we'll double our chances of getting the short sale approved. Ugh, and I thought, no, all Butch Jenkins did is ruin our chances of getting my approval done now. Because what happens is, anytime there are two offers put in on a, uh, on a short sale, the only person that's gonna win is the bank. Because now the bank can use those offers to play us against each other. So the very last thing you want as an investor is for another investor to come in and put an offer in right behind yours. I had mine verbally approved at fourteen thousand seven hundred fifty bucks, and now this other guy comes in and puts in an offer for twenty-five grand right behind me. So naturally, who is the bank going to accept? Are they going to accept my offer? Or are they going to accept Butch Jenkins? Well, sure enough, they went to go accept Butch Jenkins' offer. And here I was furious. I'm like, Mrs. Jenkins, I don't understand. Why did you feel the need to go work with somebody else kind of behind my back? I'll be honest, my feelings were a little hurt. I felt like we had good rapport. I felt like I was taking good care of her. And she said something to me that I'll never forget. She said, Sean, I had no intention of doing anything to harm you. I thought that two people working on this would be better than one. And I thought right there, you know, God bless her, she is doing what she thinks is the right thing to do. Unfortunately, it did nothing but screw up the transaction. So I said, okay, you know, I understand, that makes sense, Miss Jenkins. I, if I would have thought that to be the case, I guess I would have done the same thing in your shoes. And honestly, that's my fault as an investor for not preparing her that that is not in her best interest to do. Uh, obviously, now we've got two offers in, we've got the bank competing with both of us, trying to get both of us to raise our offers, and now they're thinking there's some significant interest in this property because two people are putting bids in, and the offers are all over the board of where we're bidding. So now the bank's even thinking, well, maybe we should hold out, maybe we'll get 30 or even 40 grand for the property, right? So I call up, I, I asked Mrs. Jenkins, I said, can you tell me Butch Jenkins' phone number? Because I'm trying not to jump to too many conclusions yet, but I also realized that Butch knew I was working on this and he tried to talk the homeowner into doing something a little underhanded, you know, working with him instead of me. And I thought, well, let me at least call Butch and I'll have a conversation with him and see if maybe he'll relinquish his offer. So I called up Butch and I said, Butch, we got a little challenge here. I said, you know, just so you know, I put in an offer two weeks ago for $14,750 and I got that offer approved. And he said, wow, you got it approved. My offer was significantly more than that. I said, I know, your offer was 25 grand. I said, do you have a buyer lined up for more than 25 grand? He said, no. And I said, do you think you can sell it for more than 25? And he says, well, I hope so, I think so. I don't, I don't really know. And I said, well, here's the deal. I've already got a buyer lined up to buy it for 26 grand. I said, really, it's in the best interest of you right now. This is already a done deal. I'm gonna ask you to relinquish your position uh, withdraw your offer, that way maybe I can get the bank to accept something close to my original offer. We can get this thing closed, uh, there can be some money made on it, Mrs., uh, Mrs. Watson can do the right thing here and get out from underneath this and everybody wins. And I said, are you willing to do that? And he said, absolutely not. And I thought, alright. So I went to step two. The only other thing I knew to do was to offer him a piece of the pie. I said, alright, here this is the deal, Butch. If you're willing to relinquish your offer and I can still get my end closed, I'll split some of the profits with you on what I'm able to buy and sell this property for, just for you to walk away. And he said, absolutely not. So now I've got a jerk investor that came in, snaked my deal out from underneath me, doesn't even have a buyer lined up like I do, I've already got a closed deal ready to go, and he's not being cooperative with me. So naturally, the only thing I could do, I didn't have a buyer lined up for more than 26 grand, and I'm not willing to spend more than that on the property. 
So I told Mrs. Watson, I said, I'm out. Good luck to you. Good luck to Butch Jenkins. I hope you guys can get this thing closed. And sure enough, Mrs. Watson called me about a month later. She said, Sean, and she's in tears. She said, Sean, I can't believe it. Butch Jenkins came in, he made the offer, he got a written approval from the bank, and he can't find anybody to buy it for more than what he's buying it for, so he's canceling his offer. And she said, now my house is going to go to foreclosure, and I can't believe all this happened. And I thought, man, you know, I know, Mrs. Watson, you were trying to do the right thing by having two investors work on it, but that is never, ever the right answer. So now, anytime I go on a new appointment with a homeowner, I tell them a, kind of a condensed version of that same story just to let them know, you know, hey, here's what can happen. If you're going to deal with two investors at one time, no one's going to win but the bank. So I just let them know right up front, if at any point in time, any point in time, you ever don't feel comfortable with how I'm handling the process, just let me know and I'll be happy to back out. But the last thing that you need to do is have two investors submitting offers on this at the same time and here's why. And I just explain that little, I usually condense that story down into about a 60 second or maybe a two minute little story about Mrs. Watson and I let them know she lost her house to foreclosure because she thought she was doing the right thing but it wasn't the right thing. So from that point forward now when I tell that story to a new homeowner they don't ever want to deal with anybody without consulting with me first. And now it's in their best interest to do that as well because they know Miss Watson didn't intend to lose her house and have Butch Jenkins come in and ruin the whole thing, but that's how it turned out. So it immediately built trust with me even more. It gets them to never want to work with somebody like Butch Jenkins again without talking to me first. And it virtually eliminates my competition. So that's part three of the competition killer. I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you've gotten a lot out of it. Please put these to good use and start using them in your real estate business right now and you'll start to see the results right away. That's it for now. More soon. This is Sean McCloskey. I'll see you later.